Yeshua said he had come to fulfill the law and the prophets. The promises and prophecies given by the prophets and the law or the Torah as it is called in Hebrew. In the Torah there were several laws which all had to do with cleansing. Biblical speaking, when something is clean, it means it is holy. The Ten Commandment law placed in the ark was designed to keep man's heart holy and clean. Then there were dietary laws that were designed to keep the body clean, to avoid diseases, etc. There were rules to keep clothes from carrying germs. Then there were rules to keep your home clean, where we find laws on how to deal with plagues in the houses. And then there were criminal laws that were to keep the country clean from crime and to hinder suppression between the citizens of what was then the country of Israel. In addition, there were sacrificial laws that had prophetic messages. And then it was the feast days that were a memorial of the past as well as a prophetic view of the mission of the Messiah. We learned that Israel's past experience was itself prophetic. In these feast days, the entire mission of Messiah was encoded, from the sacrificial lamb slain at Passover, right up until the very last feast day. These feast days, like the other laws, explained how Messiah would cleanse the earth, or restore or bring justice. So all laws were about cleansing and dealing with sin in man's heart, body, house, and earth. Now God gave seven holy sabbaths centered around seven months. Now, for instance, if a house or the clothing of a man was unclean with a plague, then the house would be isolated for seven days. Then the priest would come and inspect the house or the piece of clothing. Then it was either declared clean or it was declared unclean. In the Bible, the number seven is often used to explain a time of inspection and sometimes probation and fulfillment. When we read the story of creation, he inspected the work he had done every day, declaring it to be good. But as we know, after the fall of man, the earth was in an unclean state, and the fall of man was produced profound consequences that have affected land, sea, animal life, and mankind. When Yeshua said he had come to fulfill the law and the prophets, it means he came to fulfill the entire Torah. That means the laws of the heart, the laws of the flesh, the laws of the land, the sacrificial laws, and the feast days. But you might think he didn't do that. That's right. But he is doing that. The process of his mission to fulfill the law is not over until he has fulfilled it all the way. That's why nothing is over yet. That is why we are still on this miserable planet, fighting for survival. Yeshua started. When he first came to earth, obeying God's law, fulfilling the sacrifice, paying our only ransom, and he went up to heaven to continue fulfilling the law and the prophets until it is all fulfilled, and the world again is restored and the criminals have been sentenced and judged. Now notice these words of Yeshua, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass. One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. A part of this law was therefore also to isolate the infected planet and then come back to declare it and the people on it either clean or unclean. And when a priest did this with a house, he was allowed to remove the infected stones and let the uninfected remain. Paul says, For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. The Torah priests did the same procedure with infected clothing, and clothing is a symbol of our righteousness in the Bible. So God chooses to give seven holy Sabbaths over seven months. He decided that the month Abib, which is today around March-April, was to be the first month of his year. So man today is not following God's calendar. He said, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So, 14 days into the first month was when God's illustration of the plan of salvation began. It was when the Passover lamb was slain. When John the Baptist saw Yeshua, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And when Yeshua hung on the cross, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Passover lasted a week and contained the first two of the seven holy Sabbaths. 
one Sabbath at the beginning of the week and the other at the end of the week. During the week we also have the day of the first fruits and I will show how Yeshua fulfilled it. The lamb was picked out the tenth day of the month. In fulfillment of this, Yeshua rode down to Jerusalem with a large crowd the same time in the month Abib. The lamb was taken to the temple where it was examined for faults and blemishes, as no Passover lamb was allowed to have any blemish. Yeshua came to the temple the days before Passover and was questioned and examined by the priests. Both the Sadducees and the Pharisees questioned him to find fault with him, and their conclusion was, they could not take hold of his words before the people, and they marveled at his answer and held their peace. And then certain of the scribes answering said, Master, thou hast well said, and after that they durst not ask him any question at all. So they were not able to find fault with him. Then they captured him and had him sentenced to death. Notice the Roman counselor wanted to release Yeshua, and he said to the leaders of the people that they could decide what should be done with him, and that he didn't want to make the decision. So the priests, along with the people there, decided he was to be killed, despite even the Roman counselor finding no fault with him, and expressing it openly. According to the New Testament, Yeshua was killed at the same time the Passover lamb was to be slain. So Christ's death was the beginning of the cleansing of the world in the beginning of the prophetic feast year. The next thing Yeshua had to fulfill was the day of the first fruits, falling on the day after the Sabbath in the Passover week. On this day the priest was not allowed to eat any bread until he had presented the first grain from the harvest before the Lord's eyes. And he shall wave the shaft before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. But did Jesus do this the day after the Sabbath? If he didn't, he didn't fulfill the Torah. The New Testament tells us Yeshua was put in the grave and rested there on the Sabbath. And then he, that's right, resurrected on the day of the first fruits. But he had to come before God with the first portion of the harvest, along with himself, a first fruit. It's written that when Christ resurrected, he resurrected with a certain group of people, it says, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. So they resurrected at the same time as him and were the first fruit of his sacrifice. So when Yeshua met Miriam or Mary right after the resurrection, he said to her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to the brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father, and to my God and your God. So Yeshua goes up to the father with the first fruits. The first group of resurrected and himself who is also the first fruit and he comes before the father receiving his acceptance after the requirements of the torah a few hours later the very same day we know his mission in heaven for this particular day is already done and he is back and meeting with the disciples and showing how according to the law he has been with the father so now he can be touched and he asks for something to eat Many Christians have made the day of resurrection the new weekly Sabbath. Because he resurrected on Sunday, they think of it as more holy than the Sabbath of the Ten Commandments. This is because in the first centuries, Christianity was mixed with paganism at a time when Jews were despised. This left many Christians without understanding of the truth within the Torah describing Christ's mission. They think everything ended at the cross and now we are free to make new rules. Yeshua said on the cross, it is finished, because the ransom was paid, the means for our salvation, but it did not mean his work for us was over. The end of all sacrifices ended with his, his final depth paid. But Yeshua didn't undo the law at the cross, he was fulfilling a part of the law. And on the day of his resurrection, he continued to fulfill the law, this time the day of the first fruits. So this particular Sunday, already had significance in the plan of salvation, foreshadowed in the Torah, but it was not a holy Sabbath. At the same time, the seven feast day Sabbath were designed to show God's plan of salvation and the restoration of man, so were the seven items in the sanctuary. 
The first, the altar, also represented the work Yeshua did, dying in our place. On this first holy Sabbath, Christ had lied and rested in the grave. The next was the cleansing basin representing purification before entering the holy place. This high Sabbath was regarded as a memorial of when they walked over the Red Sea, the Egyptian army was drowned and they were delivered. In Revelation 12, we learn that Christ's blood has defeated the devil from accusing us before the Father. Christ is now free to enter the holy place on our behalf. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Israel walking through the Red Sea, water and cleansing is important aspects of this second feast day at Passover. The important thing here is that there is some sort of cleansing taking place before Yeshua enters the holy place. The next feast day was in the third month and is also called the Feast of the First Fruits. They were to count 50 days from the day of the waving shaft at Passover, the resurrection day, until they landed on this next feast day. The two days were to be connected with a bond because they were both about the first harvest of Christ's mission. This day was also a memorial of the day God announced the Ten Commandments to Israel. Jews normally kept the day in memorial of this event and to present the first fruits of the harvest. The days before this feast day they were to humble themselves and open up their hearts to God's law. Now, Yeshua told the disciples to do as was their usual practice, to prepare, and the disciples were gathered in prayer and humility according to the custom until this feast day arrived. On this day, Yeshua poured out the Holy Spirit upon them, which resulted in 3,000 being saved, giving them the Holy Spirit the same day he once announced God's law fulfilling the third feast sabbath as part of his mission again as you see yeshua continues to encourage and keep and fulfill the law after his resurrection now the first time israel heard the law proclaimed by the lord at the third sabbath it was with fear but now the law was declared through the holy spirit in their hearts just as yeshua had promised he would do at the new covenant write it in their hearts the disciples said and we are his witnesses of these things and so is also the holy ghost whom god hath given to them that obey him and yeshua said he could not give the spirit to those refusing to acknowledge god's law so the giving of the law was connected to the giving of the holy spirit uniting the past meeting of the feast day with the new covenant meaning because the Spirit is not in conflict with God's law, but fulfills the law with the person it dwells in. Yeshua had said he could not give this gift unless he left them and went to heaven. He was only able to give the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, this third feast Sabbath, if he was in heaven as their high priest working on their behalf. Now many have claimed that Yeshua has assigned them to be his vicar while he was away in the sanctuary in heaven. And it's true Yeshua did send a vicar, but Yeshua himself tells us this vicar was the Holy Spirit and no human had been left with that task. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of Truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. So anyone claiming to be a vicar might be in conflict with Yeshua and his true representative. So three of the seven Sabbaths were at spring, and according to the Bible, fulfilled at Christ's first coming, and him entering the sanctuary in heaven. The three Sabbaths representing the beginning of Christ's work of fulfilling the law and the prophets. The next four Sabbaths landed on the seventh month representing the finishing work of Christ. Seven is always the end or the completion or rest. 
It started with the first day of the seventh month when a loud noise would be heard, a warning of something to come, and this trumpet signalized the beginning of the end, preparing the people for the next holy Sabbath called Yom Kippur, or the great uh, the Day of Atonement. This was the day the high priest would enter into the most holy place with the Ark of the Covenants. A few days later the Feast of Sukkot came lasting for seven days and then the day after sukkot the last of the seven feast days of the seven month came closing the holy day cycle and we're going to talk about these four feast days as they are related to the ark of the testament now in the book of revelation we can see yeshua in the sanctuary in heaven but john sees him at the fourth item the candlestick first, and the vision given to John was of things to come, meaning prophetic. It says the candlestick is a symbol of Yeshua's work for his people on earth, and standing by this candlestick we see Christ then giving a message to his churches throughout time, again the number seven in seven churches. The message to these seven churches is encouragement but also a warning that they will be judged in the future if they don't listen to the Spirit's working. So just like it was in ancient Israel, the Feast of Trumpets was a warning of Yom Kippur coming, a time when God would inspect his people and see who was sincere and who wasn't. And we all know today, too, that not everyone claiming Christ's blood are really Christians. We have among us child molesters, unloving people, people who treat their elder, elderly parents with disrespect, psychopaths, you name it. They're mixed together, all claiming Christ's name. Not only that, but the different churches themselves have different theology and practices fighting amongst themselves as to who has the truth. Some are obviously disrespecting God's law, others in more hidden ways. So I think we all agree that Yeshua can't just look in the church books to decide who he will save. He needs to do an investigation of his own. And that is what happened to Israel on the Day of Atonement. Even though he had claimed them to be his special people, they had to go through this investigation. It says about the Day of Atonement, For whosoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. Remember the cleansing laws, the priest left the house, piece of clothing or the man with the plague for seven days, then came to investigate and declare the house, clothing or man clean or unclean. It's the same task Christ will perform as a priest fulfilling the law and the prophets. In the same way Christ as a priest starts an investigation in the seventh month of his year. So from the Yom Teruda until Yom Kippur, the people of Israel had to examine their own hearts and ask God forgiveness for their sins. And this is what Christ does at the candlestick. He warns the seven churches that they must listen to the Spirit and make changes if they are, if they are on the wrong path, which he claims many of them are, or else Yeshua lets us know they will be judged, even though they are a part of his church. Next time we see Yeshua in the sanctuary is sitting before the altar of incense. We are told the incense represent our prayers and the high priest was to enter the most holy place in heaven with innocence, meaning the priest was to take our prayers into the most holy place on Yom Kippur. Now notice that the warnings of false prophets and beasts in Revelation is tied to God's people in the way that they are warnings for them not to be deceived by these powers. They need to be separated from false religious authorities in order to be saved at Christ's second coming. And it's all connected to the time we are living in now prior to Christ's second coming. Will we at the judgment in heaven be considered clean or unclean? Will we be separated from spiritual Israel and taken out of the camp? In Revelation, the most holy place in heaven is opened at the last stage of the walk in the sanctuary there. In order to save the congregation of Israel, the high priest had to go all the way to the Ark of the Covenant and place the blood on the mercy seat, but also sprinkle blood seven times in front of the Ark. Again, seven is used in the holiest of holies, symbolizing a completed work there. If the high priest came out alive, Israel could rejoice that they had passed the day of investigation. 
You see, if they had really turned from their sins, they would have confessed them and transferred them to the sacrifice, and thus they would be cleansed from their sins, as the blood taken to the mercy seat above the law would represent that their entire penalty had been paid. Our penalty was paid on the cross, the full amount, it was complete. Therefore no new sacrifice was needed on the real day of atonement. Christ only needed to bring the proof of his sacrifice at Passover to the holiest of holies. So what happened on the cross is the same that saves us on the day of atonement. No new blood, but the same blood. This is why the cross is the only key to our salvation. There is no merit for us on the day of atonement, if it wasn't for the cross. What happened on the cross is our only hope. The blood shed there is our only sacrifice and our only hope. There is nothing else that saves. And it's the blood of the cross that saves us during the investigating judgment. So by this blood, Yeshua takes the innocence, our prayers, along with his own prayers, into the most holy place as a witness to the law there. And if we have given Christ all our sins, then the law is not against us. This is why the warning to the churches is given before and during the judgment. It's crucial that we realize our sin, that we understand if we are deceived on the wrong path or if we have allowed an evil personality to take over so that we can give Yeshua our sins through prayers and so he can represent us in the holy of holies through the blood of the cross. When Yeshua leaves the holiest, as we see in the book of Revelation, the judgment will fall on man, and they will be judged according to the law in the Holy of Holies. And all this happens before Christ's second coming. Now the reason we know the time of this event is through the prophetic feast days and the Bible prophecy. Also we learn that God will investigate his people before he comes, as the true priest just before he comes back, Christ will declare right before, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. So just like the priest in the Torah, whatever stage the house, clothing, or man was in when the priest came back, that's the condition they had to stay in. So when he comes, it has already been determined. The warning sounded at the true feast of trumpets to the churches is a call of, for reformation back to God's truth, a preparation for the true day of atonement. And on the next high Sabbath, the judgment in heaven started and will last until Christ no longer is in the temple and the wrath of God is poured out from the temple and the Ark of the Testament. So four feast days foreshadow Christ finishing his work to clean the sin-infected planet. First a warning to his people of a coming investigative judgment, then the day of atonement, and then the happy day of Sukkot. The days of the feast were days of joy and relief because the day of atonement was over and they had been reassured that they were forgiven and their sins forgiven. On this day they were to take branches from fruit trees and make a hut. In the Old Covenant, it was a reminder of their time wandering in the desert and as a thanks to God for bringing them into the Promised Land. They were only to keep Sukkot after they came into the Promised Land. They were to harvest branches with fruit there. Now the fulfillment of this Sabbath is when Christ gathers his people having the fruit of the Spirit. He collects the branches. In Revelation 14, Christ's second coming is portrayed as a harvest. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Trust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud trust his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And in Revelation 14, we see all the autumn Sabbath, a loud warning given to all the earth, a warning of judgment, and then the harvest, the same as with the autumn feast days. The seven feast day Sabbath is the Sabbath of Sabbaths, meaning the final rest after the cleansing process. 
As the Lord rested on the seventh day after creation, on the seventh day after he brought man back by dying on the cross, and now the seventh Sabbath, representing rest after Christ's work as a high priest, starting with him dying on the cross and ending with him gathering his faithful. It's over. In the book of Hebrews, he talks about entering the promised land as a symbol of the true Sabbath rest, a future Sabbath in God's promised land. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, for he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the example of unbelief. The seventh thousand year after man's fall, when sin affected the world, there will be rest. Sin is no longer committed and polluting people's lives. The earth is left desolate, and Yeshua has a home of rest in heaven for his people until the time the Sabbath rest is over and the world can be rehabited and recreated. But this recreation is not foreshadowed by the seventh feast day Sabbath. The seventh Sabbath is rest. Just like Christ rested in the tomb on the Sabbath and started the work of harvest on the first day of the week, Sunday. In the same way, the recreation will start after the millennium Sabbath. Which leaves another part of the Torah that Yeshua had to fulfill if he was to fulfill the law and the prophets. According to the law, the land or soil were to rest every seventh year as a cleansing process. Then the eighth year they could start and sow and harvest again. Israel didn't keep these Sabbaths according to the law and when the first temple was destroyed, God would not allow a new one to be built until the Torah had been respected and the land had been sanctified by getting the Sabbath it had been robbed of. So, no starting over until this had been done. The Lord said, To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath, for as long as she lay desolate she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. And the land also shall be left of them and shall enjoy her Sabbath while she lies desolate without them. If you count every seventh year, the seventh Sabbath year has been violated during the sin of man during six thousand years. It's one thousand years that the world must be left desolate in order to be sanctified. And that is just what we learn from the books of Isaiah and Revelation. The world will be left desolate and there will be a time period of a thousand years. Now that's what Sabbath means, rest. According to Revelation, the new Jerusalem will be built in heaven and then lifted down to earth and God will recreate the planet to the beauty it once had. Until then, the planet will have its thousand year Sabbath rest. We also read that there will be another final judgment after the thousand years. Here, God is obviously waiting until after the earth required Sabbath rest to finish the final judgment. Then it is written that there will be a final war between the resurrected doomed and the new Jerusalem. But the work of the high priest illustrated in the feast days is over at Christ's second coming and him granting the saved a Sabbath rest. It's this work that the Lord will rest from, and he will not become a priest again after the rest. He will just be a victorious king. But there is a deception out there saying it is still possible to be saved in the millennium. But according to the law, Christ's work as a mediator is over at this time. The reason there are so many different interpretations of the last events of the world's history is that many preachers don't read the Torah or don't understand that Yeshua's mission is revealed in the law and must be understood from the law's perspective and not by adding guesswork to scripture. So if Messiah's mission and work is connected to the Torah, you will understand the prophetic statements related to his work. As it is written, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And Yeshua said to his apostles that the spirit of truth, the spirit revealing truth, is only given to them that keep his law. So here is our safety guide in understanding what is true interpretation of Christ's mission and future events connected to his work. And Paul says that the secret of the man of sin who deceives the world is that his gospel is separated from the law. It is lawless. 
Let no man deceive you by any means, for the mystery of iniquity does already work, even him whose coming is, after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Concerning the new Jerusalem it is written, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Notice it says, The throne of the Lamb. You see, in the temple was the sanctuary service, God's means to reconcile man with his throne and kingship. Now that only the faithful remain and sinful behavior is over, there is no need for a temple, no need for reconciliation. Man will have access to God's throne directly. It need not be hidden behind symbolic objects to protect the people. There is no conflict between the foundation of the Lord's throne and his people. So there will be no third temple. Man will, as Adam and Eve once did, be able to see their Lord and communicate with him directly. So here is my theory. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is the Lord's earthly throne. It represents the foundation of God's kingdom, the Sabbath law revealing him to be rightful owner, and also the blood that bought back the children of the kingdom. I think this Ark will remain on earth as the Lord's throne to the people of earth for all eternity. As the Lord said, for the Lord hath chosen Zion, he has decided for his habitation. This is my rest for ever, here will I dwell, for I have desired it. And he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be, shall be between them both. The Lord shall reign for ever, even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations. Praise ye the Lord. So the ark, after having received the blood upon the king's seat, reuniting man with God after receiving the blood on the cross is no longer designed to work in a sacrificial system or for a atonement in the temple. Its work is over as that. The reconciliation is made. So when Christ died and the blood had reached the throne on earth, the sacrificial system on earth was over. It's written about him dying on the cross. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielding up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. So notice how the rocks are rent, opening the way down to the ark at the very same time as God tore down the veil of the temple, shutting down the earthly sanctuary system at the same moment as the path to the ark was opened. And Ron Wyatt, claiming to have found it, says, At his last visit, the chamber where the ark stood, that the staves from the ark had been removed, meaning it had its final destination, now only waiting for its master to come claim it. Now there are several prophetic scriptures, not only prophesying the true Passover, but also telling us when Yom Kippur started in heaven. And we're going to look at these references from scripture dating this end time event in the next episode.